All right, let's see if the recording works this week. Uh, since I figured out what happened last week, which was the joy of a Windows update happening in the background, resetting my USB bus, which caused everything using the USB bus. Oh. Um, all right. Welcome to week eight. And nothing's working. What's new? Um, what we're going to be covering starting this week is shell scripting, also known as programming, with a shitty programming language. That's going to make Java look like the best language on earth, um, which is a statement unto itself. Essentially, I'm going to go through this set of slides this week, and it, there's a lot of them. Next week, I'm going to try to go through 9 and 10 in one week, because we're getting close to the end. And there needs to be some gap space at the end. I've already had uh, two crappy weeks this term as it is, one because of a fire alarm, another one because of my back. So I don't have a lot of wiggle room left for everybody. Um, however, labs 8, 9, and 10 are imminently doable via Google, um, surprisingly so. And these slides are essentially a reference sheet for pretty much everything else that you might not find on Google. Um, at, the, at this point in the game, you guys should understand basic programming constructs. And that's when I looked at the slides for 9 and 10, which is basically going over basic programming constructs, with just uh, the difference in syntax. Uh, I intend to just highlight the differences between a sane or somewhat sane programming language and, and bash scripting. Um, by sane, I'm referring to a language that actually, you know, has types and, you know, real if statements, that kind of stuff. Yes? No, th this is bash scripting, not batch scripting. There's a difference, even though it sounds the same. There's an extra letter in there. Um, the big difference is between the two is bash scripts are significantly more powerful. Um, it's more comparable to PowerShell scripting. So if you've done PowerShell scripting, it's more comparable to that. Actually, PowerShell is more powerful than Bash by orders of magnitude. Um, but basically put in Bash in batch files, DOS batch files, you have, if you want to do a loop, what are you going to use? A go-to. Right? You go to a label, go to a label over and over. This has actually a while and a do while and, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, don't say yes until you experience it. So, basically put shell scripts, and there's a bunch of different languages for shell scripts. It's not just bash, there's also ZSH. You can also write them in Python, or PHP, or Perl. You have your pick of language. Uh, however, since bash is so ubiquitous, and it's everywhere, a lot of basic file system tasks are written in bash scripts, whereas pulling up a Python executable for that's a little excessive. Um, it's like using an air hammer to put in a drywall screw. It'll work, but you know, you're overkilling. Essentially, a shell script is a text file. It has a bunch of commands in it. They, it's what's called interpreted, which means it doesn't go through. It doesn't go through a compile phase. It reads the file and starts to execute until it hits an error, or it successfully finishes. You can use it to automate tasks. For example, example nightly backups, uh, cleaning up your log files. Uh, maybe every time you set up a new website, you can set up a bash script to do um, the initial skeleton of your site for you. Um, user management, since, you know, as you guys did the labs for user management, it kind of sucks. Um, so a lot of systems, the administrators have scripts that are pre-canned, and they can just run, they use the canned scripts. So they don't need to remember all the weird parameters because somebody took the time to write it once. And then you want to add, you'd want to manage the users, they'd run a command like manage users. Um, as usual, there's decision making. So if statements, loops, and functions. Um, they're, they, they say what they call a top-down language. It starts at line one, line two, line three. So if anybody here has ever worked with interpreted languages and scripting languages, you'll feel right at home. Um, now, it's an interpreted language, like I said, which means it doesn't do a pre-compile. 
Uh, that's the one big bad thing about interpreted languages. Unless there's a massive syntax error, it's gonna it's not gonna blow up till it, you hit the mistake. Uh, it's weakly typed, so Java guys, your variables can hold anything. Just so you know, there's no data type, so you don't go, you know, new variable name or int variable name equals new int. It's you know variable names equal to something. In other words, Java, on the other hand, is object oriented. This is not, they're considered high level languages. In other words, you're not writing assembly. Um, it's a hybrid compile, as in it does an initial compile, creates a, a set of bytecodes and executes the bytecode, and it's strongly typed. Now, some basic shell scripts could be, these are samples, and um, if this, the first one here is an example of a file that could be called who's on. And essentially, it prints out the date, lists out their user currently logged in, and it then executes who am I. Yay. Um, same thing with list root. It's a single command that drops to the root of the directory and executes the present working directory. Shell scripts are basically an amalgamation of different commands you can run at the command line. But there are also what they call built-in commands, which are for loops and stuff. Now, when you create a shell script, um, there's two ways of handling it. Um, this is the first one, which is you add it, you make it executable. Which, so you guys have seen chmod so far. And up till now, when you talked about the executable, in other words, making something 777, we only spoke about it as related to directories. If you make a file 777, or at least turn on the executionable, ex executable bit, it means that you can now run the command from the command line, such as dot slash whatever the command is called, and now you have a script file that executes just like a regular program. And you can create your own directory of scripts, and you add them to your path, and then at that point you should theoretically be able to just run it. Um, that's about it for that, but most people, at least for the labs, will just pop them in their home directory and just run them from there, because it does the job. The other way around, if you don't have permissions to make your files executable, which it happens, uh, you can bypass the requirement to have the executable bit turned on by typing in the command bash space, whatever the script is called. Then what it does, it launches um, a new bash instance and runs the commands inside of it. So it actually starts what they call a subshell. So it's as if you launch a DOS prompt inside a DOS prompt, for those of you used to working in Windows, uh, um, which is not something you can do in Windows. But you can execute a bash inside of a bash. So for the lifetime of that script, it's running in its own shell in its own environment, which actually has some benefits of its own because it isolates the variables and stuff to itself. So it doesn't affect your outside as much. Um, if you want to execute it with the current environment, then you use a command called source. Or you can get really lazy and go dot space, whatever the script file is called, and then it'll still execute it. So, so far you've seen three ways of running your bash files. You either make it executable, you start with bash as a subshell, or you run a current shell with either source, or use just the shortcut period. So any bash script makes while it's running your current shell affects your current shell. It means if your bash script modifies your path, your path stays modified until you log out. When you run it as a subshell, if it modifies the path, it's only for the existence lifetime of the subshell. At the top of the file, the first line you should always put in is you tell it what command interpreter to use. So that means you can use different interpreters in different scripts. Um, so it's basically the first line would be pound exclamation mark, and then it's a path to an executable. Often you'll see this as slash bin slash Python or slash bin slash Perl if they're Perl or Python files. Since these are bash scripts, it'll be pound exclamation mark, mark slash bin slash bash. And 
they are useful to want to run in a shell other than the one you're trying to run it in. In other words, in this case, they're going to run it as TCSH. And if ever you want to play with TCSH, it's basically uh, it's a shell that uses the TCL language as its scripting language. It's a useless language. Do I TCS a TC? Script should be executed by TCSH, no? Yeah, it's a typo. I've read that slide four times and I'd never even noticed it. Yeah, it's TCSH. Now, what's the most important thing when you program? Comment everything. Don't be Dan. My code's so well written, you don't need comments. No, I expect you not, actually. My code's self-documenting, for the most part. Very rare are there comments in there because I'm doing this because I'm an idiot. But there is one comment like that somewhere in my code because I couldn't figure out how to do it. <coughs> you use the pound sign for comments. If the pound sign's in the first character of the first line, and if it's not followed by an exclamation mark, um, or if the pound sign occurs in any other location, it treats it as a comment. In other words, if the very first line is a pound sign, without the exclamation mark, it's a comment. But if it's pound sign, exclamation mark, it tells it you're going to run it as a separate shell. I will pull up a few uh, shell scripts in a bit to show the difference. Okay, variables. Like any other language, you've got variables. Yay. Um, they hold strings and numbers, as always. Uh, you can change them, compare them, do the usual stuff. You don't need to declare. So this is where a lot of Java people have a hard time. You don't declare your variables, you just start using them. So anybody who's ever used lightly type, uh, loosely typed languages will feel very comfortable with this. If you've worked in BASIC or Python or PHP, Perl, any of those languages, this you'll feel fine with the fact that you don't have to declare your variables. Literally, oh, idiot equals insert value here. Wait, did you feel targeted? Nothing. The assignment, as I showed, is syntax is literally variable name equals value. It's very similar to what you're used to seeing in other languages. Um, however, this is where a lot of people make their first mistake. There cannot be spaces. It is anal retentive about its spacing. Um, I once had a student where I spent half an hour trying to figure out what, the, that was last year, trying to figure out what was wrong with their script. And I kept looking at it, I saw nothing wrong. And then I just accidentally deleted a space and it started working. And I'm like, yes, no spaces when you're assigning variables. Now, when you're referring to a variable, this is where things get a little strange. People have a hard time with this also, is when you declare the variable, there's no special characters. But when you want to refer to it, you have to prefix it with a damn dollar sign. So in other words, my var is equal to something. Then you want to go, my var is now dollar sign my var. Anytime you want to refer to it thereafter, you have to prefix it with a dollar sign to tell it the existing variable. Hot damn. So the only time you don't put a dollar sign is the first time you use the variable. After that, you always have to refer to it with a dollar sign. Why? I have no idea. <coughs> Arithmetic expressions. Please note the double brackets. If anybody here has ever played Lisp, this will feel familiar. If you've never looked at Lisp, think Count your lucky stars. It's the stupidest language on earth. But list likes lots of brackets and apparently so do bash scripts. If you want to evaluate anything, you have to put in double brackets or parentheses, depending which English word you want to use. Round brackets or parentheses, the same thing. And you can do the usual stuff. You can do the plus plus and the minus minus. Mind you, the plus plus and the minus minus is only after the variable name. You cannot pre, as you do in some other languages, you can go plus plus variable name. You can't do that. It's only variable name plus plus or variable name minus minus. But if you want to use that, you've got to put in double brackets 
Otherwise, it may or may not work. I've seen it work and I've seen it not work. Yeah, no. Stay away from spaces. Now, the only, depending on the circumstances, there are the odd case, but usually stay away from spaces. Um, if you want to use an exponent, two stars. Then the rest of these you're used to seeing. Multiply, divide, addition, subtraction, and of course, the good old percent sign for give me the remainder. Yay. Hey? Yeah, modulus. So, here are some examples. You want to make a count equal 10 plus 20. Literally, no spaces. Brackets around everything. You want to increment by 1, you can go plus 1 or plus plus. They both work. And that is how you do the math in a bash file. They all look the same. As you might have noticed, there's a few other things you can do. If you don't want to actually create a variable, you can put a dollar sign in front of the double brackets and then it treats it as a variable. So this says, oh, by the way, let's, let's you know, treat this as a value and it'll execute the contents of the brackets first and then output it. That's just how it works. Um, if you want to do floating point math, you have to use a special program. It doesn't do decimal places. It knows about strings and it knows about integers. If you want to have floating point, you have to actually use an external calculator. Hey? No. Uh, yes, theoretically. Yeah, it usually, well, usually the negatives work. But I've seen one student script where it didn't work. Why? I don't know. I'm guessing there was a space somewhere. And after the first guy where I spent half an hour for a space, I said, I looked at the code and said, okay, you got the right idea. You can spend the next two hours debugging it or I'll just give you your points. I mean, he had all the concepts were all there. It's just that if you only fed a negative number, things went weird. If you gave it a positive number, it worked. But somebody else could do with negatives and it worked. And I was comparing them side by side and I couldn't tell the difference. So, you know. All right, now. Can you uh, nest brackets instead of brackets? As far as I know, yes, I've done it. But you got to, it's always double brackets, then double brackets. It's, you got to put in double sets all the way through. So no matter what, it has to have, you have to have matching sets of brackets. So if you want an expression instead of an expression, brackets uh, inside, the, uh, the inside of each one. So is that what you're asking? Yeah. Now, conditionals. Conditionals are special. Um, because your operators aren't your usual operators. As you can see, you're gonna, those of you that are used to greater than, than, less than, equal, not equal, you got none of those. Can anybody take a guess why? No, not spaces. Yeah. They're input-output ca characters, right? Greater than means output. Less than means ga gather from here. Uh, exclamation mark has some other meaning. So a lot of these things that you're used to using, ampersand, ampersand. Ampersand means, you know, send to background. So there's different commands. Yeah, you can use ampersand to send something to the background. He's going to go type it in and try it. Um, there's various ones that there's the characters all mean something, therefore you can't use them for testing. So they decide to get clever and you know, they created comparison operators. MacBook, how's it going? You're late. 24 minutes late to be precise. Yeah, it's at 4 o'clock, dude. Have a seat. Okay. Now, there are a few ones you can use. Apparently, the equal sign does work. And you can also do exclamation mark equal, which is not equal. Um, if you do dash n, 0 and dash z is 0. 
Um, there's a bunch of different arguments. So there's less than, greater than, equal to, not equal to, which you've seen. There's also dash s, give it a file name. You can check see if the file is empty in one line. So you can see if it's a zero byte file or not. You can check if you have permissions. So you can check see if you're allowed to write to the file. It's a great thing to do, especially if you've got a bash script that actually you know, modifies the file somewhere that maybe you want to check for permissions before you go and you know, make changes to the file, um, especially if you don't own it. Uh, you can check see if the file exists, dash e. These are all typical arguments. <coughs> I'll be pulling up a script in a bit to show you guys some of these examples. Um, now, positional parameters. Did you guys learn about parameters when you're learning Java? Command line arguments? You start your Java program, then you put a space and you give it an argument? Eh? Not really. Did you learn it for batch files? OK. I got nothing to work with then. OK. So essentially, you can send arguments. You know how you, you use your command line tools in Linux? You go ls, space, and then you got some arguments. Well, you can do the same thing with this. You can pass up to nine, uh, 10 arguments, technically, 0 to 9. And if you want more than 9, you can use shift, and then it'll shift it up by so many positions. So um, if you go shift 3, it'll go to argument number 12. Uh, if you're writing a script that takes more than like three or four arguments, you're probably doing something wrong anyways. But theoretically, you know, that's how it works. So, for example, if you have a command where you have two arguments and you pass an argument one and two, you'll go echo dollar sign one, and then the then the second argument. Um, so at the bottom, you've got how the heck did you write this? I was looking at it earlier today. It made sense last time I looked at it. OK, so argument 0 is the name of the script currently running. I should have known that anyways, because it's the same in DOS. Um, and then each of the arguments thereafter, so 1 through 9, will be the arguments you need in. Um, essentially, positional arguments are separated by space. That means for each argument, you have to have a space between them when you run them from the command. So if you were to go display it, space A slash B, it'll let it A and B. And when you shift, you, know, you can figure this out based on this slide. Essentially, you got arguments one time, argument number 10. You do shift one, that means they'll take all your arguments, move them over by one, which then suddenly one becomes two, two becomes three, and nine becomes 10. Like I said, if you're actually writing scripts that take more than nine parameters, Actually, if you're writing scripts that take more than three parameters, you're probably doing something wrong, because that's a little excessive. Just putting it out there. Um, once again, shift three, and you'll have arguments one to nine, and then if you shift it by three, it starts at four, because, well, one plus three is four. All right, there's a few special parameters. Uh, they're preceded by dollar signs. And dollar sign, pound sign, expands it to the number of the positional parameter. Question mark expands the exit status of the previous command. So in other words, if you ran a command and it actually has an exit status, as in 0, 1, or something else, as in it succeeded or not. Um, and do double dollar sign is the current PID. Um, the PID is the program ID. So actually every time you run any command in Linux, it gets given a program ID. And it's a process ID, program ID, process ID, depending on whose terminology you want to use. And it's an ID that identifies a given program. Windows, we actually have process IDs in Windows, it's just Mike Windows hides it from you. But they're there. Uh, if you actually want to experiment, you actually have your VM open right now, drop the command line and type in the command top. 
and hit enter. And you'll see a bunch of currently running processes on your machine. And you'll also see a number. That's the PID. And it's kind of important to know what the PID is, so that way you know what process is running, so you can actually kill the process if you need to, if things go horribly wrong. OK, <coughs> an exit status. One of the command has successfully kept it shareable. And if the command fails, it'll be equal to something non zero. Basically, zero means I succeeded and nothing went horribly wrong. So exit status zero means nothing wrong. Anything else from that is something has gone wrong. And you'll see values both positive and negative. A lot of people like having negative values for error messages. Negative one, not authorized. Negative nine, you suck. And some people will actually use positive values and negative values, and you actually have to test for the positive and the negative values because some people try to get clever. The exit status can have a value of 0 to 255. Theoretically, like I said, you can have negative values. Um, normally, depending on who wrote the script, they won't be. Um, for example, if you're working on true with true Unix, not Linux, negative values are very common. So if you're working with BSD or uh, Solaris or any of those big true Unix environments, they use negative values all the time. Uh, Max love negative values for some unknown reason um, because positive values are not cool, I guess. Don't know. Um, and if you choose, you can return uh, an exit code by typing in, like, the command would be exit space the code. So if you decide to make your script fail, so you ran some commands and you discovered something's not right, you could theoretically tell it exit one, and that, that means the command failed. That, that, that means that if your script is being called from another script, it'll know it failed. Uh, exit status is used most in scripts and often inside of an if statement. Uh, why inside the if statement? If file exists, exit one. In other words, you don't want to overwrite the existing file. Or if not allowed to write, exit two, because you don't have permissions. You just get to pick your values, forever you want them to mean, as long as you can document what the heck the error messages mean. Um, something else that you may experience is you want to run more than one command at once. Well, not at once, but one after another. And semicolon. So this actually works in DOS and in PowerShell also. Type in your first command, semicolon, second command, semicolon, third command, semicolon, and hit enter. It'll run the first command, then it'll run the second command, then it'll run the third command. And I use this one on a fair regular basis. My wire keeps getting caught. Um, one of the examples I use it for is when I'm developing against the, open, the ERP system where I have it work, it's written in Python. And we have to run a service. And on my development environment, I'll stop the service when I make a change, restart the service so it recompiles my changes. And then, but I want to track what's happening in the log file. So I'll actually go service space stop, open ERP, semicolon, service space start, open ERP, semicolon, tail dash f, the log file. So that means it'll stop the service, start the service, and then next start opening what's coming from the service right away. That way I can keep track of what's happening, watching the log file going back. Um, that's, you know, the semicolon business, where if you want, I run more than one command, one after another, but you don't want to separate them on multiple lines. Um, <clears throat> if you want to run the next program only if the first one worked, double ampersand. A single ampersand sends the program to the background. Go figure. Typical. Um, if you want to run the program only if the previous program failed, double pipe, just like or in your uh, Java programs, right? Um, if a command is followed by an ampersand operator by itself, it's executed in the background in a subshell. So command number one, ampersand. 
command number two. It'll start command number one with a subshell, send it to the background, and let it run in the background, and it'll start up the second command. Those are little tricks you can do. Now, this is something you may have seen in DOS, export. <coughs> Let's say you create a variable and you want it to be available to another script or you want to overwrite an existing uh, variable. You can use the export command. Um, how many of you, when you were installing your Java environment, pooched your path? One. And I know, the, not necessarily in this group, but I know I fixed at least eight last term uh, because then Postgres wouldn't run because the path was pooched because the instru instructions for Eclipse apparently weren't very obvious. When they said modify your path, it, they didn't mean delete it, they meant add to it. Um, essentially, you can modify the path inside of a shell script then you export it and it'll overwrite the existing values in the path. So once the shell script ends, It'll create environment variables based on whatever the variable is called. So you can go export whatever you want to call it is equal to something, and it'll actually create a variable that's actually available to the entire to your shell thereafter. So it'll keep running, and it's still in the thing. So you can run one script; it outputs a value. You could run a second script. It could ask the system, "Give me this environment variable." Hot damn, it exists. So that's how you create environment variables. It will clear when you kill the shell. <coughs> so that means if you're running it in a subshell, it won't exist once it leaves the sub. Once the subshell ends, it'll it'll die. So you guys are used to scope, variable scoping. Same idea. Essentially, this creates a global variable available to your currently live scope. And if you happen to be in a subscope, in other words, you're in a scope inside a scope. If you create it in there, it's only available in that bin. But if you create it in the outside bin first, the one inside may have it, depending on how you set things up. Um, now, if you modify the value in the script after you've exported it, unless you re-export it, guess what happens? It doesn't change it. So it basically put you can export a value variable, put it in memory in an environment variable, then make changes to it for the rest of that script. But unless you export it again, it doesn't put it in the environment variables. It basically treats it as two variables side by side that are called the same thing. And you can imagine how good the debugging goes when you start doing stuff like that. You're like, I set the value. Why is it not keeping it? Because you didn't export it a second time. You can type in the set command. This is the same as Windows, uh, if I remember right. And you can hit the set command. It shows you all the environment variables that are currently defined. It's kind of cool. Um, if you want to just see variables that have been exported, in other words, that weren't created as part of your, um, that were created before your script was run, you'd use the env command. And that'll list only those variables that have been exported and available to a subshell. So in other words, ENV is a subset of set. Echo. How many of you have seen PHP at one point in your life? Okay, you know Echo if you've seen PHP. Uh, it's the same thing as print. You output something to the system. Basically, it goes to standard out. Remember, I think last week I talked about standard error and standard out? This will send it to standard out. And um, basically put, it ignores spaces. So one space, five spaces, one space. Makes no difference. You can put as many spaces as you want in arguments and just put one space between each of them. So if you want to get fancy with your spacing, that's what periods are for, or underscores, or dashes. You get fancy with your printing. You go echo this dot, 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 dot. Put in lots of ellipses. No. Uh, escape characters may or may not work. 
Quotes might be your only saving grace. Make sure you use the right ones. Double quotes. So theoretically, you could go echo, quote, this, bunch of spaces was, bunch of spaces very, close quote, then you'll have all your spaces. Because at that point, it is how many arguments? One argument. Because the quote marks transform into a single argument. Which we just, there we go. Took care of that one. <coughs> I love it when I don't need to even read the slide. Um, to produce some output without default new line, you can basically hit dash n, so you go echo dash n, and it suppresses the following line. Because usually when you do an echo, it'll automatically put on a new line on every one. And this is where some people notice the difference between Windows and Linux. In Windows, it's a new, the carriage return new line. In Unix environments, it's just new line. In other words, you give it a new line, it always goes back to zero. With Windows, you go new line, it just goes down one line, but stays at the same column. With us, you have to feed a carriage return new line. Um, for those of you that don't know what a carriage return is, do you ever use a real typewriter? You'd hit the lever in the end and the head would go to the other end. That's the carriage return. You're, I know, people are laughing, well, it's old technology. But they worked. Um, there's also E. So as Chad here asked me, he goes, can you do escape characters? Technically, yes. Um, you have three you can pick from. Uh, you can go backslash C, which basically kills a trailing new line. Um, or you can force an extra new line, so you could go enter, enter. So you could go backslash N twice. Uh, you can go backslash B, which is a backspace. So you could say enter your name colon, backslash B, backslash B, backslash B, backslash B, and it'll actually go, it'll output it and then erase it. Why? I don't know. But you could. <coughs> if a script takes a file name as a parameter and the file name is an embedded blank, um, you're not going to have a good time. As usual, quote marks to your rescue. Um, but you got to put the quote marks inside the script also. So, this is actually two arguments, right? Oh, no, no such file to directory. Why? Because it's going to go ls my, but it doesn't exist because it's my desktop. And you're like, hey, I'm clever. I'll put it in quote marks. It still bombs out because it expands it into two being two separate words. On the other hand, you put it in quote marks in here also, it'll treat it properly. Bash script. Um, it's because it's loosely typed, it doesn't actually know what's inside its variables. So it's not smart enough to actually go, hey, this has got a space in it, maybe I need to quote it. You know, that would have been, you know, a little bit of extra programming for someone. In other words, they put the onus on you. So ls-l, quote, dollar sign, one, close quote. They'll give you the long listing of the My Desktop directory. <coughs> okay. You can make decisions. This is something you guys know about, right? If statements. Theoretically, you should know what an if statement is. If you don't know what an if statement is and you're this far into the program, you think you've got other problems. Um, you're going to have big problems. Now, this is not like your typical Java C if statements. It's if condition. And of course, make sure you put your condition in. Double bracket. Then execute your statements. And what does ends the if statement? Fi. Not end if, not curlies, if coming in and phi coming out. Why? Because somebody thought it was really clever to reverse the if statement to show its ending here. Um, if zero, condition is true, statement following the then will execute. You also have the choice of an else statement. If, then, else, run some stuff until it hits fi. This is structures you guys should know by now, so I'm not spending a lot of time on it. Um, you can use and or not operations. 
And these ones are the ones you're used to seeing. Ampersand, ampersand. Uh, double pipe and exclamation mark. Um, in other words, if you're using it as a conditional, both programs that you're using have to exit, ex exit with a zero. In other words, both of them have to succeed. Because have you noticed something a little bit weird about our Booleans? We're doing a we're checking conditions, right? And it goes, if it returns a zero, assume it's correct. Normally, Booleans are the other way around, right? One is true, zero is false. In bash scripts, zero is true, one is false. Actually, no, let me phrase that. Zero is true, everything else is false. This is another gotcha that screws students up when they start writing their first bash scripts. Zero means nothing went wrong. Zero means nothing went wrong. Zero errors. Anything other than zero errors means something went wrong. Congratulations. Good luck. Um, but you guys know about and or not. I mean, you know this from Java, so theoretically. <coughs> this is exactly the same. The syntax is a little wonky. Because you'd have bracket, bracket, something, close bracket, something bracket bracket. Yeah. We even have else if. It comes as elif. Why? Because else if was too much to write. In other words, else if elif. And it cannot run by itself, just like an else if in Java can't run by itself. It can't stand by itself. So here's a multi-level if then else example. If condition then, that means the condition is true. It executes commands until it sees the elif statement. Elif condition one, then it executes. That means the condition is also true. It executes commands until it hits the elif, then else fi. It's just like the same thing you're used to doing in Java. It's just the syntax is a little different. Um, getting user input which I think you guys probably learned in Java, getting uh, input from the command line when you did your little game. Yeah, you guys did a little game depending on who you had teaching your course. I don't remember what you guys had this time. Was it a dice game, I think it was? Hey? Solitaire. <coughs> so this is the same thing. Um, you go echo, there's your prompt, semicolon, read. So the command's read. And then you give it a variable name. So whatever gets typed into that gets put into that variable name. So if you go enter, re-echo, enter your name, semicolon read my name, and you type in your name and you hit enter, the value will go into a variable called my name. Uh, the read command has a few things. You can actually make the read command display a prompt. So instead of going echo enter your name, you can tell it dash p, here's your prompt. Um, silent mode. In other words, if you're asking someone for a password and you don't want to know what, you know, you don't want to actually display what's being typed in, it does silent input. So for those of you guys that had the experience of, I'm typing in the past WD command and it's nothing's happening when I'm typing. And at least half the class had that problem going, nothing's going on. And then they don't remember what they set the root password to because they started going like this. Um, silent mode. T is for timeout. That means you could wait a certain number of seconds. And at the end of that time, it assumes the person is not going to type anything in, and it continues with an empty variable. <coughs> uh, command substitution. You can run a command in a subshell. So you get a shell script running. And you can say, at this point, run another command outside of me. So launch this subshell and run it. As notice, find brackets. It loves its brackets, not the bracket bracket, because bracket bracket is a condition or a statement. Single bracket means run it as a sh subshell. Um, yeah, it's pretty cool. That's well, essentially when you look at that example, it's going to run the pwd command and feed it into ls. And this one's doing, it's going to take 
the PW command, output it to ls, take the value of ls and put it in a variable called t. So you could ls the contents of your present working directory and shove it into a variable called t and then you can do whatever you want with it after that. New lines are replaced with a space. That means you'll have one giant long string. So essentially, if you've got multiple lines, each line will then become a parameter of the previous command. So if pwd returned more than one piece of information, it would return it as separate arguments for ls. So if you take, if you normally output If you have an output that goes, normally if you did ls and it output and like that, it would transform it into like that, just so you get the visual of it. Um, that's what the transform does. And actually, here's a full example. At the top, it says it's going to run in bash. It checks to see if the first argument is a positive number. In other words, if dollar sign pound is equal to zero, um, then it echoes. You must apply at least one argument. Exits one. In other words, it fails. Fi. Um, as you can tell, the person who wrote the slides was got a little clever with their uh, lack of brackets. Uh, historically, you don't want to mess around with your um, your brackets too much. As you can see, see the square brackets? It says if you're running this command called test. Test does the same thing as the square brackets. The square brackets is basically the shortcut version of it. So instead of writing if test dollar sign this, you could actually just put brackets instead. That's why they put a comment here so you could see that was an option. So if argument number one is greater than zero. It'll go number, basically argument number one is a positive number, otherwise it's not a non-positive number. <coughs> uh, you have to in this case, um, because it's actually using the dash, and the dash is actually a command line argument. Fun. Um, the, because that's basically how the test command works. You can actually run the test command from the command line right now if you wanted to. You can just type in the word test. And you, then you give it two arguments and it'll actually do the math to check for you. Uh, variables have a default value of none, of nothing. This is an argument. So you're, you're running the command. So for example, this was called example.sh. You go example.sh space five. The five is argument number one. That's what dollar sign one is. Like that. This becomes argument number one. And if I had a six here, that'd be argument number two. That's what that that's what's up there. If you don't have a variable defined, if you create a variable, right off the bat, it's, em it's empty. It's null. Yeah, if it's equal to zero, in other words, it's checking to see if the first argument is actually a positive value. So if it's, any th if it's not equal to zero because, um, <coughs> basically put, when you comes in here, it'll actually transform it to a positive integer no matter what. So if it's less than zero, it becomes zero. Bash script. Um, here's another example. Um, basically put, it's checking to see if your current working directory is a specific directory. And you can see the first line, of course, tells it to run as a bash script. Then it goes directory one is equal to dollar sign pwd. In other words, it's going to shell out. A runner subshell ask for the current working directory. Assign it to the directory one uh, variable. Then it's going to go if, and like once again, the square brackets basically is equivalent of running the test command. If directory one is equal to home user one, 
then your current directory is this. Otherwise, no, it's not. Yes. Um, this just... Still recording. Oh, no. Man, I'm almost done, too. Oh, that's never good. Red lights are never good. Yeah. Oh, oh, green light. Let's see if it comes back from the dead. <sighs> okay. <coughs> hey, what's the first rule of tech support? Tur did you turn it off and turn it on again? Yeah. What's question number two? Is it plugged in? What volume? Hello? Oh, that's there. It'll record. Oh, yeah. It automatically adjusts the volume. It's all good. It's probably better with the coughing I was doing, too, that it's not explosive. Um, example number three. It gets user input. So, again, line one is run as a bash script. Echo, do you want to continue? Read into yes, no. And if yes, no is equal to y or, as you can see, it's y. And theoretically, you should also check for low case, an uppercase yes and mixed case yes. As you can see, there's no way to do mixed case testing. So always assume you're going to say yes or no, or yeah, y. Pardon? Uh, theoretically, there are a few command line tools you could run to actually change the case. Uh, I don't remember what they are off the top of my head. You can Google that. Where? Which one? Which one? Read yes, no. That, that's basically, do you want to continue? It puts a prompt on the screen, and then it waits for your input. So basically it's saying test for lowercase y, test for uppercase y. If either of these are valid, say you entered yes, otherwise you entered something else, and you output whatever the... Yeah, it's assigning it to a variable. So if you go read yes, no, yes, no, it defines a new variable right down there and sets the value to it. I don't think it's overheating. I think it's dying. All right, so you guys can read this example on your own. I'm going to just get to cut through this because this is almost the end. The case statement is one of the last ones. <coughs> you can also use a case statement. Um, Java people have, uh, um, it can only check case statements against uh, integers. Java. It's a special version of case. What the heck is this thing doing? <coughs> Red light. Okay, I got three lights. Okay. Okay. Okay, here's our example of a case statement while we well, well if I still got a screen working. So, first line you've seen, read. This time we're using a prompt instead of echo and then read. We can read dash p for the prompt. Feed into yes no as you've seen. Then you go case dollar sign yes no in. 
And then you give the choice of the different values, and it's fun because you go lowercase y. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, the case statement was the last. Yeah, it's a switch statement. Um, in Java, you can switch on an, on an integer. I, as of Java 7. Okay. It's pretty recent. <laughs> um, yeah, as of, was it, two years ago? Two and a half years ago, you couldn't do a switch statement on a, on a string. Um, my information may be slightly out of date, obviously. But I'm not that far out of date, considering it's not my primary language. <laughs> it's not my language at all. Um, okay, so this is all the basics of bash scripting. Next week is just covering more details of of what's involved with bash scripting. Damn, it's only an hour in. I'm giving up because of the projector. I would have kept going with the other slides, but I don't know what the heck's with that. <coughs> I'm not going to talk just for an hour. Yeah, there was only one slide.